Welcome back to the Something in the Wilderness podcast. It's a music discussion podcast about the music of Andrew McMahon. And today, we're bringing back a returning guest to the show. The last time, she threw us a curveball with a song that, honestly, I didn't really know. But the one we're talking about today, I'm much more familiar with, though it is still a deep cut. And I'm interested in what she has to say about it. So welcome back to the show, Lindsay. Thanks for having me. So glad to have you back. So glad we could make this happen. What have you been up to lately? So what's new? Nothing really um, other than getting to see Andrew. I know we missed each other at the concerts in the Midwest. It was uh, a near miss, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> it was. Because uh, I went to the rave show, which you weren't at. Mm-hmm. You were at the other two that, that weekend, right? Mm-hmm. I thought it was great. How about you? Yeah, it was an excellent show. Um, I just talked to another former guest about that show and our experiences there, and I loved it. And what's also funny about not seeing you is that we hung out with some of the same people. We did, yeah. (laughs) Myself in Grand Rapids, you in uh, Milwaukee. But yeah, great show, of course. It was was such a great variety of songs, and I like that he played different things. Even though I only went to one show, I like that he played different things each night. I had kind of stayed away from the set list because I, like you, do not like surprises ruined for me, which actually, I mean, I guess, can we spoiler alert this since he's in the UK or overseas now? It's probably, we're good, right? I would say we're definitely good. Like I, like I said, I just released a whole episode about, about it and there's a link to all the set lists and everything. So the starting the show in the middle of the GA area, mind blowing to me. Like that was one of the coolest things yeah. that I think he's done. Do you happen to know what that box he was? Is it like a music box or? That was my interpretation. So I was right, like he walked right up to us pretty much when mm. he did that in Grand Rapids. And yeah, it was a little box and he was like turning a crank and mm-hmm. he had a strap over his shoulder. So allegedly the music was coming out of the box. I don't know if it was amp, you know, mic'd or whatever. Yeah. That was the appearance anyway, as, as if that was making the music that was coming out of it. Amazing. I don't know if you did the sound check or the VIP portion no, at I did. all. Did you happen to see uh, what they gave out as merch at that? Was it a poster? So they did a poster. Uh, I'd say the quality of the poster was not my favorite, but it's because, I think anyway, they moved the budget over to the other thing, which was a journal. And on certain pages in the journal, he's got song lyrics from it, uh, different songs in there. It's super cool. One of the most unique things I think I've ever seen for merch, especially at like a meet and greet Uh VIP thing. I, of course, the next morning went home, like Snapchatted all my girlfriends, like, (laughs) oh my gosh, look at this merch. And all my girlfriends, super jealous. So <laughs> it said deer and then a blank line and he wrote your name in it and signed underneath it. So, you know, and the style of Dear Jack. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I saw it. I did see Julie's. I actually forgot about that because we met up before the show uh, between meet and greet and the show. So, yeah that, yeah, that was pretty cool. I didn't know. I didn't realize. I don't think I realized there were quotes throughout, though, throughout the book. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't know. He's killing on the merch. I'm loving it. How about you? Anything exciting for you from the concerts? Yeah, I mean, we we met Andrew afterward, and that's always exciting to get to talk nice. to him. And and just, I'm a social person. I love meeting up with other fans. So, But yeah, so it was cool to hang out with people a little bit before and afterward. It was kind of like a sidewalk party outside afterward. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that. Are you going to have the chance to see him later this year at all that you know of yet? Yes. So I bought tickets to when we were young, Fest, oh, cool. so that I could see the something corporate reunion. Hopefully, I know Vegas is a big city, but hopefully I'll run into you somewhere there. Yeah. We can make it happen. Booked my flight. My wife is working on booking hers right now. I've already booked a room, and so and then we've invited some other friends out too. Well, the the song that you chose to talk about today is uh, one that was off an album that came out in 2011. I don't actually remember anticipating this album much, which you know it's probably just the it's been over 10 years now. I don't remember, but I do remember having the album on iTunes, and I remember burning it on a CD. And I do remember that this CD remained in my car from 2011 until the time that I no longer had a CD player in my car, about 2016. It was in regular rotation for that whole time, I would say. Uh, I specifically have a memory of singing along to this song and the other songs around it because it's a fun one to sing along to. So the song we're talking about today is People Running, and it's off of the album People and Things, released on October 4th, 2011. It's track six. And it's sandwiched in between songs like Hey, 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 We're All Gonna Die and Amelia Jean. And I mentioned that along with Amy I, kind of, I think it's right before Hey, Hey, We're All Gonna Die, because 
to me, that was the most memorable part of that album. And I don't know about now. Now my perspective's changed a little bit. But I remember always looking forward to that set of four songs. It was like the middle of the album, and it's like, yeah, now we're going. But I, I think I've come to appreciate the whole album entirely more. I, I remember you saying on the last time we recorded that you maybe had just graduated college when this album came out. Is, is that right? Yeah. I graduated nursing school, actually, Mm -hmm. um, in May of 2011. So I was a brand new baby nurse Mm -hmm. working in the operating room, trying to figure out life Mm -hmm. a little bit, as you do, figure out how to pay for student loans and such when all of this happened. And actually, in retrospect, when I was going and pulling dates, I knew this was right around the same time that I had seen him in concert when this album was released. And like pulling this concert information like confirmed so many things for me so thank you for making me do a deep dive on this because i knew he had headlined with guster and i knew i saw him at ravinia and that was all i could remember out of this Mm -hmm. and i have said for years that there was a point when he was touring where he had a keyboard that sat on top of his piano and he would play up on the keyboard with one hand and down on the piano with the other and Everyone would look at me like I was crazy when I talked about this. I'm like, no, I swear. And then uh, people thought I was nuts and didn't remember this at all. There are pictures from this Ravinia show of the keyboard sitting on top of the piano next to the little Buddha that he has up there. I found the pictures online from the Ravinia show that they had. Yeah, so (laughs) I feel like very confirmed in this. I don't have strong memories from that. Like I know... He's played songs from upcoming albums before his shows, Mm -hmm. and I don't have strong memory from that show of him playing anything from People and Things at Ravinia. The only memory that I truly have from that show that's like a strong memory is it started raining, and he had started playing a song and went, oh, this is perfect, and then started singing, I'm going to send a little rain your way. Like That is the strongest memory that I have from that show, and I Nothing mm-hmm. from people and things that I remember. Well, you remember that uh, that year's show better than I do because I saw them earlier in the year. I, I do have a video from that show, believe it or not. Uh, it was not a people and things song. So, okay. And I checked the set list. I do not believe they were playing people and things stuff before the album came out. But Yeah, which is wild to me because I saw the, that it was, it was September... I want to say it was September 3rd that they played at Ravinia. And then the album would have came out, you know, that that following October. Oh, wow. So, If I had seen him on that tour, I think it would have been the day after. Because I looked up the date of when, that would have been, when he would have been in town. And, and I'll tell you why. I found it odd that I saw them in April 2011. And we drove to Dayton, which is about an hour and a half away from our house. And then I saw they were here in September right in Columbus. And I'm like, why didn't I go? They were with Guster. I love Guster. Yeah. And I realized the timing. Okay, September 2011. It would have been a couple weeks after my daughter was born. So oh. we weren't going to concerts for a while after that. No. Yeah, so that, <laughs> You're a little busy. Yeah, so that explained why we went to the Dayton show three, uh, four months prior, something like that, Versus the Columbus show. That makes sense. <laughs> so, but I did look up set lists from that time frame, and I don't, yeah, I don't think they were playing anything brand new, nobody had heard before. So, I have heard that mixed reviews, maybe you know a little bit more than I do about this. Do you think that the song title was based on the album title, or was the album title based on the song title? Because I've heard, I think I've heard both or read both somewhere. I had sent you that interview, mm-hmm. that video interview, and he talks in there that he wanted to talk about people. And I think if I remember correctly, he referenced either in that or when he was discussing the songs on his Spotify session that he had done, that he was referencing the album title. The song title, like people running comes from the album title? No, other way around. Okay. I thought the album title came from the song okay. title. Okay. Like he wrote the song first. So obviously I'm really confused. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> t- <laughs> All right. So a song called People Running was written. And mm-hmm. then because of that, in part, he decided to call the album People and Things. Is that what we think? I feel like, I think that, yes. That would make sense. I think that it was, yeah, I think it was just more like a testament to like everything going on in life and that he, you know, just wanted to touch on, you know, there's people coming in and out and things. It was the the video where they were running. Yeah. Oh yeah. The 
I think that's kind of where the trailer for the album. That was it. That's yes. right. I did watch that again today. So, yeah, I found this quote from an interview from the mid 2000s when Andrew was discussing his decision to begin Jack's Mannequin. This was well before People and Things, by the way. And I thought it was really relevant because some of the word choices. So when you listen to this quote, you'll know what I mean. And he was talking about not being in something corporate anymore and moving on to Jack's Mannequin. He said the songs that he was writing for Jack's Mannequin were about, quote, coming home and having home be way different than he'd remembered it, abandoning a lot of people and things that I had normally been so attached to, exploring and being okay with myself and having to make excuses for who I am and accepting who I am. This was, again, years before they did People and Things, but I just thought it was neat that there's a quote, him talking about the, about Jack's Mannequin songs in general and, re- and mm-hmm. saying People and Things. So so since we're touching on this now, because I was going to bring this up later, uh, you know how like the whole Taylor Swift fandom, they're all like, oh my gosh, she hides all of these nuggets there's for, hidden clues. for us. There's hidden clues, right? Okay, hold on. I'm just pulling out my copy of Three Pianos now because, of course, I have to deep dive everything, right? I love that. If y'all want to turn to uh, page 209 here at the very bottom. Should I grab my book or something? <laughs> yeah. So he has the very last uh, sentence on page 209. The ceilings were shiplap, the carpets green, and the walls were home to fishing spears and paintings of sailors and sailboats tilting at the wind. Ah. Uh, We have the title of this album when the book came out. In two cases, it's in print what his album title was years before the album came out. Years before. And he had the first original, like, 10-minute song, right? So I think he out Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift. He did, yeah. Look out, Taylor. (laughs) Andrew's coming for you. (laughs) That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. I was, I kind of laughed when I read that. (laughs) How did you come across that? Were you rereading the book, or did you just happen to remember that quote, or...? This is actually the chapter around the same time when he was writing people and things. Mm -hmm. So I just was like briefly today reading through that chapter to see if there was anything to add to our discussion. And I read it and I was like, no way. Amazing. (laughs) Yeah. I have a paper copy of that book, the signed copy, and Mm -hmm. I have the um, ebook as well. Mm -hmm. So I can actually search text in the ebook, you know, like you can with ebooks. And I've I've literally done that before to prepare for episodes. I'm like, I wonder if he mentioned do do do. You know, yeah. I think it was Kavanaugh Park is what I was looking for. I was looking for references to Kavanaugh Park in the book. <laughs> but I will a little peek behind the curtain on the podcast there. I will continue to do that as well. So just like you can internet Go search, ahead. I can search the book. That's right. <laughs> cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. I read that the album was recorded between November. November 2010 and January 2011, and post-production wrapped somewhere around March 2011. Players in the song, including Andrew on vocals, piano, and keyboards, Bobby on guitar and backing vocals, Jay McMillan on drums, Tim Pierce on guitars, Jamie Mahubarak on the B3 organ and keyboards, and Chris Chaney of Jane's Addiction on bass, which always surprises me. Kind of like the... Uh, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, kind of like the Tommy Lee thing from Motley Crue on, on the first album, Jack's Mannequin album. Yeah. That always, always surprises me a bit. Yeah. So after looking through this list of uh, of players on the song, and I know it varied a little bit throughout the album, who was in that trailer that you sent me? So um, just for context, everybody listening, Lindsay sent me a trailer, which I'll share in the show notes, basically promoting the People and Things album. There's a voiceover from Andrew. Uh, it's very serious. And, Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the video is, I wouldn't call it goofy, but it's not, it doesn't feel as serious. They're actually running, like jogging through the city. Do you recognize those uh, other band members in there? Bobby has blonde hair. It looks like, I had to watch it a couple times Uh because I was like, and then I, I'm pretty sure it's Mikey that's running next to him on on the right. Not a hundred percent positive on that. It like, height wise mm-hmm. and like hair wise it seems right yeah i i don't know because mikey wasn't in the band it seems like kind of at that time like he came in not for right the recording after the, yeah not for the recording right he came in after it was recorded and he came in to tour the album yeah. i think it's him though yes yeah. <laughs> so. i also wondered is one of those guys a lot less hair jay i also think yes okay that that would make sense i mean he was there he was in the band at the time 
full disclosure, I have facial blindness. So some of picking uh, celebrities or, or people that I'm not familiar with on the day to day, or if people change their hair dra drastically, it's really, really hard okay. for me. That's why I like really, really stared. I'm nearly positive it's Bobby. So It was very difficult to see their faces. I mean, if mm -hmm. I didn't know that was Andrew McMahon in the front from all the clues, such as what the video was about and his voiceover and all of that, it might have even be, been hard to tell because he was wearing sunglasses and he was jogging. I just don't think I've ever seen Andrew jog before, but hey, that's cool. That's, no. you know, it's all good. But yeah, so it was a little, it was a little surprising, I guess, the whole, the whole thing. That was a, that was a really cool video. Like I said, it was, it felt very serious, but he made mm -hmm. some references to his past and how he was kind of looking to the future with this new album and kind of some things he had learned along the way. I, I really liked it. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I think he had a lot of really good things to say. And actually, one of the things that he had said in that video, I think, really tie into what the theme of the song was. I know um, we were kind of talking about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he, one of the things that he had said was, I love this album for what it says and what it took to get there. And I think that's what a lot of what this song is, is about what it takes to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. He talks a lot just kind of about like what it is to, to be a person. And I kind of think that's the entirety of this album in general. You know, he said, I wanted to talk about the world I lived in, a world where love is not the stuff of greeting cards but a trench war worth fighting, mm -hmm. a world of tenuous connections, drifting in and out of relevance. I began recording, but something was missing, so I started over. I moved to the desert. I'm curious, kind of in that statement, what some of that meant. Like, mm -hmm. was the starting over like he was trying to start over, or was the starting over like I missed something in the songs that I was writing, and so I started writing them over? <laughs> And so, like, the batch that he had, like, maybe we haven't heard yet. Yeah. Maybe they're going to show up on later albums. Maybe they already have showed up on these, you know, releases and in, in the Wilderness albums. Apparently, you like songs best that Andrew rarely plays in concert. <laughs> I guess. You know, I guess I do. <laughs> they've all, Jack's Mannequin only ever played this five times, I found out. and yeah, Which is funny. so weird to me. Would this not make a great concert song? I also feel like it would. Also, the wild thing about that is they played it five times, so probably on the album tour. Uh -huh. And in the book, he said they played 200 shows on that album <laughs> tour. So that means that they didn't even play it 5% of the time when they were touring. That's crazy. Yep. A little bit of dropping a little bit of math there. But, <laughs> at, but you are correct. And that is surprising because even more so, they played it three times leading up to the album coming out. So I know I earlier I said I don't think they played it on the previous tour, but I think they mm. I think they started touring people and things like a week before the album dropped or whatever, right? Okay. Yeah. So they played it three times that week and then twice the two weeks after, and that was it. Did the fan base kill it? Were all of us like, oh no, that is not the one. That's a good point <laughs> because I know he puts a lot of stock into fan reaction. We actually that's what I talked to him about after the show last a few weeks back is is how, what songs are really hitting with the crowd. And uh, we talked about Smoke and Ribbons, of course. So maybe that was it. Maybe he played like five <laughs> new songs and that was the one that was like, no, get rid of it. Yeah, that's, yeah, Ouch. that's wild. Come on, me. come on, mm -hmm. Jack's Mannequin fans. <laughs> and so probably already know the answer to this then. But how many times mm -hmm. has Andrew Man in the Wilderness ever played this song? Well, I'm going to go with zero. You would be right. <laughs> It has not been played since 2011 when that album came out, which is just shocking to me. I guess one of my questions about these numbers, are these on set lists? They're on set list FM, so it's only as good as the people who are updating it, I will okay. say. And, and I've I've said that disclaimer before here. I probably don't say often enough, but I, I think it's assumed at this point. So there's a chance that this has been played at a sound check somewhere. Oh yeah, yeah. The okay. <laughs> sound checks are not on Setlist FM. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've seen them. I don't. I don't know how to put them on. So even if I knew the songs at sound check, I don't know how I would even. You know, as a as a member of that website, I don't know how I'd enter them on. But I've seen one before where somebody had a way where they were like sound check that and then regular set that. So there is a way mm -hmm. to do it, but 
I'm not going to go through and collect all those, but uh, so if someone listening would like to do that, that would be really cool so we could find out all those uh, possible hidden gems that might have been played somewhere. But it does have the live streams on there, like the the ones he even did from his garage. So, Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, so somebody's put those up. Yeah, which thank you to all those people. <laughs> the, the real heroes, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So um, you've already answered my next question. I was going to ask you mm-hmm. if you had a chance to see them during this era, but it sounds like you definitely did. Yeah. Are, are you a Guster fan as well then? Obviously not as much, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's one of my best friends from college and I. She and I decided to go and, and see the show, and she likes Guster also casually, like I like Guster casually. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're like, this will be great. Ravinia, not my favorite venue in Chicago land. I will say. It's a little bit tough to see shows there in that aspect unless you're in the seated area. Okay. It's more designed to like sit on the lawn and have a picnic. Yeah, okay. I actually saw Guster and Pete Yorn a few years prior to that in a very similar venue where yeah. the lawn's just like so far away from the stage that it's basically just hanging out on the lawn and listening to the music. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I remember being up at the seated area. There was like a gate that everyone was standing up against so that it was basically like GA but way back mm-hmm. and to watch those that show. Okay. I like a good lawn show depending on what it is, but if I really want, if I'm really invested in the artist, I really want to see it, then mm-hmm. I don't like being on the lawn way back. It's it's more of a, yeah. a social area, uh, which again can be good for different kinds of concerts. So I also have to say, the tickets to that show, in case anyone was wondering, twenty two dollars. Oh, you fi- did you find your ticket stub? <laughs> I did. <laughs> nice. So I miss those days. Like, Right? <laughs> there are still concerts that go for that price. I was just talking to my wife this morning about a concert I want to see that, that's happening in Detroit this fall. Yam House is the band, so not a very well-known act, but their tickets are only $18. And I was like, wow, oh, nice. there's still $18 shows? And, and, and that's kind of a selling point, honestly, for a band that you like, but you know, you're not 100% invested in. So 18 bucks, mm-hmm. that's nothing. So Yeah. Do you remember if you saw Jack's Mannequin after People and Things came out? So did you get like the proper People and Things set or no? I have recently been trying to go back through all of the shows um, using Setlist FM. I think I talked to you about that mm-hmm. a while ago because I am convinced that there are things that are supremely missing mm-hmm. <laughs> from this. And from I from am... your memory or from Setlist? Sorry. Everything. Oh, okay. Both. <laughs> so... I am still kind of like trolling through because also, you know, Setlist FM, things are categorized under something corporate. They're categorized under Jack's Mannequin. Some are under Andrew McMahon alone and some are under Andrew McMahon in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So I've been digging through and I'm really struggling to find between 2011 and 2014 what shows I was at. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to, to put those puzzle pieces together for myself still. Um, so honestly, I'm not sure. Okay. Those years are really easy for me because I hardly went to a concert in those years. I can tell you that. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> blanks in those years. Yep. <laughs> so, um, I, I miss the People and Things era. I miss the very early Andrew McMahon solo. And then the next time I think I saw Andrew was 20. Well, it, was, it might have been 14, 14 or 15 uh, when the mm-hmm. new album came out. So Because I, I definitely know for sure 2014, we saw him at Summerfest. Mm-hmm. But yeah, between 2011 and 2014, I'm having a little little trouble putting things together. Yeah. I went through my concert ticket stubs. Yeah, I think it was during the pandemic, like the height of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So probably three years ago now. And I found ticket stubs for concerts I don't remember being at. Oh, really? (laughs) Just I was going to so many in like 04, 05, 06 era Mm -hmm. that there are ones that are just like blank in my memory, like All American Rejects. Loved the band, still like them today. Don't remember seeing them in concert. No recollection of interesting. it. Interesting. Yeah, it's Very but interesting. But what's odd is that I not, I still remember the fact that I don't remember that particular show. It because that <laughs> that one jumped out at me. There was another one I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was two from that one year that I was like, yeah, I must have been going to just too many concerts because it's just a blur, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, what a problem to have, though, right? Right, right, right. I don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> my my five shows I get to go to a year, uh, three of them yeah. being Andrew. You know, I I I remember those. So. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned earlier that my wife and I drove to to Dayton, Ohio, to see the show in April 2011, and so I mentioned earlier also that 
I know he didn't play any people and things on that tour. So it was, it was pretty mm-hmm. early in that year. But I did take video of one particular song that I thought was a new song at the time. So I was like, ooh, they're playing a new song. I remember, th- I remember thinking this. Yeah. And I took video, and I still have that video. And I should put it on YouTube because I don't think it's out, out there. Maybe it is. Uh, but I will put it up if it's not, and I'll link it in the show notes. There were something corporate deep cuts that got past me. But I, and, and, mm. and like we talked about with uh, Jack's Mannequin the last time you were on here, there were definitely yeah. Jack's Mannequin era deep cuts that got past me. The song I recorded that I thought was a brand new song that was coming out later in the year was Watch the Sky by Something Corporate. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, but that would have been fun. Yeah. So looking back, at it, it, it surprises me that they played uh, Watch the Sky in 2011. But I, I suppose if you think about the time frame, it was only a year earlier where the Something Corporate reunion tour took place. Yeah. And that song would have come out on properly on the Played in Space CD. No, that's a good one. And he doesn't play it terribly often. So anytime that one comes on, I just very much, very much love that one. We've ta- we've alluded to this a little bit, but do you feel like People and Things doesn't get much love in the set list? I actually talked about this on my last episode uh, as, a, mm-hmm. as the recap for Grand Rapids, but... I do. Uh, So I kind of sat down with that, like we talked about. And this is kind of my very, very fragmented thoughts. So he's played television recently. Mm -hmm. And he's said in multiple interviews that was his favorite song on this album. I can see why that one tends to get picked. Restless Dream, originally he wrote that for a movie that Channing Tatum was in Mm -hmm. called 10 Years. So he's told that story. He's played that song live. And then... It's a lot of slow songs. There's a lot of slow songs on this album. For as drum heavy as this album is in comparison, I could see why he kind of stays away from those a little bit because he's not going to pep up the crowd as much. Mm -hmm. Release Me seems like such an angry song. It's so weird because it has such like almost happy and joyous like sound to it. Mm -hmm. But like when you listen to the lyrics of it, it's very angry. Yeah, yeah. the the tone The tone of it, what he was going for, is is yeah, yeah, coming from anger and frustration. But yeah, maybe it's hard for him to return to that era. Like you said, he did play a handful of them on this last tour, and he impressively played a lot of different songs. If you look at all the set yeah. lists, but there's about five of them from People and Things. That's pretty good. I can tell you that in us- my usual fashion. When we saw him after the show in Milwaukee, I once again requested out of it, as I did in L.A. when we saw him there, which he said, how are you listening to this song? It's nowhere. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, well, first of all, I I own your CD. And so he was not aware that that was released, I guess, on the Best Buy version of his CD. Oh, my gosh. That's hilarious. I didn't know he didn't know that. Or he doesn't remember. So he needs he needs the lyrics, right? So he needs to know how to play it. And so um, Jenna, very kindly of her, went ahead and made him a mixed tape to give at his next show that included that song. So yep. that way he could relearn for for all of the songs that he didn't realize. Uh, so were Jenna out there. gave him a homework assignment. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Learn so... these songs so that when we request <laughs> out of it, you know the yeah. song now. You can't say yeah. you don't know the song. Absolutely. <laughs> and and when she gave it to him, and she gave it to him in Green Bay, right? So the very next Correct. night uh, after Milwaukee, and she took a picture of him holding the CD. He was, <laughs> I think he was shocked after that conversation that she took the time to do that, which, you know, props to her for doing that because that, it, was, it was pretty great to put all that together. That's gutsy to go hand a guy his, his own music and be like, Here, here's those songs that you said you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> But helpful, hopefully, for me. <laughs> Could be, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for it because, yeah, I remember you said that you that Out of It and Last Straw, Arizona were your favorite songs at the end of the last mm-hmm. episode that we recorded. And then and now we're talking about this other song that never gets played live. So it's I like know. you must go to these concerts just waiting. Like, I, And I know I know you love all, a lot of the other songs, too. I, I know that. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. But you're probably hoping for at least one of these, right? Yeah, one day, one day. Controversial opinion, but I would be super down if all of the VIP like soundcheck stuff was all deep cuts. I mean, I feel like yeah, if that's if people idea. are paying for VIP, like they they would probably be the ones that would be most excited about the deep cuts. Not that people that aren't paying for VIP wouldn't be, but yeah. that would be like the crowd to cater to, right? Yeah, I I would yeah. agree with you. I think that that's like Broken Bird. That's a good choice because. Yeah. 
you pull honestly, you pull up Broken Bird at a concert, at a general concert, and fifty or more percent of the people aren't going to know it. But right, uh, not to right. say you shouldn't play deep cuts, Andrew. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that. Nobody think I'm saying that. But it would probably go over even better at a soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I feel like the super casual fans aren't going to be, you know, the ones that are there for the radio hits mm-hmm. aren't going to be the ones spending the extra money on the VIP. So I do like where uh, People Running is in the track list. I think it's, mm-hmm. uh, I was thinking about this earlier, It and in, in, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but I feel like it has the dark blue spot. So it's track six out of 11 tracks. Mm-hmm. It's right in the center. And it's kind of, um, it's this energetic and almost cheer, I, I hesitate to say cheerful song right in the Mm -hmm. middle of the album kind of brings it up a notch. It starts with a little bit of drums, but then Mm -hmm. it quickly kicks into this like cheery piano. Do you feel like this song has like a cheery note to it or is that the wrong way to put it? Yes, I do. More a beat, like there's hope, I guess. Hopeful? Yeah. I don't feel like the lyrics are like dark or sad or anything like that. It's just like, here's what's going on. Here's what I see sort of thing. Mm We'll dive way more into lyrics, but in terms mm-hmm. of the sound, I just feel like it's a, it's a little bit more cheerful. So I did find a quote from what he talked about with the sound of, of these songs. In an interview, he said, this album should be different than the previous few. The first, referencing everything in transit, was about breaking up. The second was about getting sick and, and recovering from it. And I hated that album at first until we wrote this one, People and Things. And then I realized how proud I am of all my work. And then, so he ended the quote with, and this album will be much more cheery than the last one, which mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if the whole album was. But I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm th- so, but so that's why I wanted to mention that quote in this particular episode because I'm pretty sure this is one of very few songs in this album that fit that bill. Yeah, I like. I guess I just disagree heavily. He has the song "Hey, Hey, Hey." We're all gonna die on there. Yeah, this release me. Like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let me read that last line again. This album will be much more cheery than the last one. I guess more is relative, right? Yeah. I guess maybe it's more cheery. More cheery? Yeah. yeah. Okay, then Glass Passenger. Okay, I'll give him that. Oh, we didn't talk about songwriting. Let's go back to songwriting for a moment. Oh, yeah. So People Running was co-written with his friend Matt Thiessen. Is that right? Yeah. That's how I've always heard it pronounced. Uh, of Reliant K. And they wrote it in Nashville, Tennessee in January 2010. And I got that from the introducing people and things from Spotify that you can find. And, and there's there's actually a YouTube uh, video of it too. I'll, I'll put a, a link. But they also wrote Amy, I, and Platform Fire together. Are you a Reliant K fan? It, yes. They're one of those bands that I love one of their albums. And I've mm-hmm. dipped my toes in the water of a couple others. Yeah. But I only really know one album of theirs. Yep, same. Okay. My experience with Reliant K was, you know, Sadie Hawkins dance, super popular, probably when you were in high school, because I think we're about the same age. So, like, I just very much have memories of, you know, being on the bus on the way to, like, sporting events, school, and, like, everyone singing that song together. And so it just, you know, it's a very nostalgic song mm-hmm. for me. That album is the the one that I am most familiar with. Oh, with see, so. mm-hmm is the one I know. Okay. Yeah. All right. I love yeah. that album, start to finish. I am just about obsessed oh. with every single song on that album. Yeah. And then I've listened to songs here and there from other uh, albums, and I like mm-hmm. some songs. Oh, uh, Air for Free, they released that in like 2016. I did get into that okay. one. Like I listened to that one all the way through, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say I went as deep on that one as mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know why. I've never really listened to the other. Maybe I should listen to that uh, one that has Sadie Hawkins on it. You know, the big thing when we were younger, too, I think they've come out and said, like, that wasn't true, but it got printed somewhere. Or some rumor got started somewhere, and then everyone's parents knew about it was that they were uh, a Christian rock band. Mm-hmm. Or that they, Or at least they started out as that, maybe transitioned away from that. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, but, that's what I thought I heard. So that, like, when I was getting more into, like, the punk pop music, my mom was very okay with Reliant K Mm -hmm. because, you know, they were a Christian band. I've I've heard that before from someone else, too, that it was, like, okay in the household because they're a Christian rock band. I'm pretty sure Matt Thiessen is is a religious person. So I think that's probably where it comes from, if there's any truth Mm -hmm. to that. I don't think they identify themselves as a a Christian rock band anymore, Mm -hmm. but I think there are Christians that are in a rock band together. Uh, And I've heard, like, (laughs) I've heard other bands describe themselves that way, too. Like, yes, we're Christian, we 
make rock music. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's where that came from. I feel like the, the songs that Matt Thiessen and Andrew wrote together, they're pretty different from one another. I mean, we've got People Running and Platform Fire and Amy I. Mm-hmm. Do these songs stand out for you in any kind of way on the album, or are they just like mm-hmm. part of the album to you? So did you listen to the Sadie Hawkins dance at all? The, the song? Yeah. So yeah. I, I listened to it because you sent it to me, and I got to yeah. admit, I heard it less than five times in my life before that. Did you happen to listen to the songs back to back at all? I did one time, and okay. but my immediate thought because you sent me the link to listen to the song was, mm-hmm. I must be listening for like similarities or something. Yeah. I couldn't find any. So I actually <laughs> I sent this song um, to a couple of friends because mm-hmm. uh, they're you know musically inclined, mm-hmm. which I am not. <laughs> what I noticed about it was. They start with that, the big drum, the do 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 drums yeah. that go into the the piano. Sadie Hawkins' dance st- starts opposite. So it starts pretty quiet, kind of with that, that more like melodic intro mm-hmm. to the drums. It sounds like to me that if you were to speed up their melodic intro that they're playing, they're, it sounds like they're strumming out the chords on the guitar. So instead of playing just like a, you know, one down to play all the notes together, they're doing them individually. Okay. If they were to speed it up slightly and strum those notes, uh, the chord progression sounds almost identical to people and things. Oh yeah, I did not pick that up. I yeah. I was looking for something like that I, or listening for it, I really was. And I did not pick them up. But I, I don't always notice those sorts of things. I try. Yeah. But... So I sent it to a friend of mine who plays guitar and I was like, are these the same chords? I need to know. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I don't think they're the exact same chords, but I hear what you're hearing. So that similarity in there, this song, I think you pointed it out on one of the last um, songs that you had listened to with somebody, but every instrument is doing something pretty different Mm -hmm. in it. So you can pick out the bass line, you can pick out the drums, you can pick out uh, the piano uh, and the guitars in it. It's a very full band song. Very full band, very drum heavy, very drum forward. which I appreciate. Same, I love it. Like that's one of the reasons why I love Foo Fighters, right? Is Mm -hmm. because it's very drum forward and heavy and, and whatnot. With that though, It doesn't have what I'm going to call the dirtiness or the grittiness Mm -hmm. of Reliant K. No, definitely not. When you picture like Billy Joel Armstrong playing guitar and that punk power chord that he does, and then, you know, they sling their guitars really low Mm -hmm. and then they kind of do the up and down uh, strumming very aggressively. That's what the Reliant K sounds like. And Bobby's guitar sounds a lot cleaner Mm -hmm. where it's just kind of like more of the gentle strumming Mm -hmm. to it. But the guitars in it sound even pretty similar to me. Again, not the same chords, uh, but just the structure of the song, how the piano comes into it, how the bass comes into it, how the drums go in and out. And the the drums even, he's playing a lot of hi-hat, it sounds like, or cymbal in it. Mm -hmm. Um, And they do that in their song too. So I see a lot of musical similarities and how they put the instrumentation together okay. between Sadie Hawkins' dance and this song. Well, I'll have to give it another shot. I, I like the song. I, I listened to it, and I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, that's a, that's a good jam there. But yeah. <laughs> but I didn't hear the comparison, so I'll have to give it another shot, though. And, and I think it's easy to get distracted from the piano, obviously, in the People Running song as well. Reliant K had some piano, and it has some piano in their catalog, too, of course. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any piano in Sadie Hawkins, though. I might be wrong. but No, it's, it's guitar. Yeah, it's I, at least, I mean, maybe song. they do. I don't have too much on the songwriting, except for mm-hmm. Matt Thiessen and him wrote it. And mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, according to that introduction to People and Things on Spotify, he just decided to write a song generally about people and things people around him doing and things. people people doing things yeah like so, <laughs> yeah. something like that but i i like i did like what he said in that about the broader sense that we're all people out here searching for something sometimes life is awesome sometimes not so much so we've already talked a little bit about the theme of the song but mm-hmm. i do feel like and, and maybe that's just a picture i the visual i get in my head when i hear this song but I kind of mm-hmm. picture people in a busy city running from place to place, like people in business suits and briefcases. And I don't think there's anything explicitly in the lyrics that say anything like that. But mm-hmm. I've I've always had that impression, that that visual. Do you feel like there's any kind of, I, I don't know, you said you get the same visual? 
not like New York City busy, but like LA busy. Like there's an ocean nearby and like people are, are doing this very rush to work, to mm -hmm. family, to whatever. There's super important, you know, men checking their watches, cars <laughs> flying past visual you know yeah it's interesting that we both get kind of that same that same vibe i do mm -hmm. honestly though i do picture new york city more oh do you <laughs> and i thought it was odd that by the way i'm just gonna add on to that the trailer for people and things that you sent me were they in new york city in that i couldn't tell where they were okay i'm not sure the where end, they were it kind of looks out over the water but it's you mm. can see the city in the background so I was not that perceptive to that yeah. apparently. Yeah, it was, at, it was at the very end of the video, but yeah. you, you were busy trying to figure out who was in the band, but like I was. Yeah, I was. <laughs> but yeah, I I like the sentiment of the song if I understand it correctly. I do feel like, and it, and it gets more and more every every year and every new technology that that comes into our culture. I just feel like we're running from place to place, and we're always so busy, and it's hard to slow mm -hmm. down. And and I, I think that's at least a little bit of what this song is about. Yeah. I like that too, to me, certain lyrics have kind of a, a call to other songs without directly saying it. Mm -hmm. So like when he starts out that we're just these people with happy tangled lives, or I guess he doesn't say with, I said with, but that really reminds me of the maybe we were made for each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. Part one and two. Yeah, wouldn't have made just that Just how they like come together. Uh-huh. And then the barely strapped in for this air conditioned drive. He references driving a lot, you know, like driving through a dream and maps for the getaway and all that songs. But he also references car crashes a lot. And I don't know, the barely strapped in piece just always makes me feel like it's like slightly dangerous, like a car crash, you know, made for each other. He talks about the orange airbag dust covering everything mm -hmm. and Cecilia when he crashes his car. And so like, for whatever reason, those kind of stick out to me too as, as, being interconnected i'm i'm looking for that in the lyrics that oh that's the first the very first verse mm -hmm. barely strapped in for this mm -hmm. air-conditioned drive i gotta mm -hmm. admit before i read the lyrics to this song there were several lines mm -hmm. i've never noticed and i told oh, you yeah. earlier and i would have said i would have said it again i feel like i used to sing along to this song a lot and still do when mm -hmm. it comes on but apparently i don't sing the actual words to this song because <laughs> uh, and maybe I'm, maybe it's just the chorus i sing along to actually because there's so much in in the verses that i didn't even know mm -hmm. i didn't even know that's what he was saying mm -hmm. like like what you just read barely strapped in for this air conditioned drive probably mm -hmm. have never sung those lyrics in my life yeah one of the ones that <laughs> i just love this line but also i've spent forever trying to figure out is this is all addition by subtraction what that what that addition by subtraction can mean and i think it's important that it leads into the simple chain reaction of the mind and so i was like like really plotting this out and uh -huh. i was like what could you possibly have an addition by subtraction about and so these are the things that i have come up with Ooh, <laughs> so, i like it so drugs mm -hmm. would be part of it and serotonin dopamine receptors so you get addition like happiness or sadness based on subtracting different chemicals being sick and uh like losing the bad cells, but gaining the experience and his time with Kelly and then learning something from psychedelics. Cause he's talked about like, watch the sky was about mushrooms mm -hmm. and kind of stepping out of his mind to learn those things. Yeah. But even a more broader, something would be like losing something. So just in general for people, marriages, significant others, jobs, friendships, and then gaining the wisdom or the good things in life. So like uh, a prominent example I can think of is like, you may have wanted this really awesome job that you saw that you interviewed for and mm -hmm. it was great and it was perfect. And then you didn't get it. And like, it feels devastating and you lost something, but then like five years down the road, you reflect on it and you're like, oh, I got right where I was because that thing didn't happen and I got this other thing instead. So these are all the things that I've decided that addition by subtraction Yeah, are. very good. I love, I love a little bit of science, a little bit of math you threw in there, but also a little bit of philosophy too in the mix. So I've never thought much about that line, but I think it's very poetic. This is all addition by subtraction, a simple chain reaction of the mind. Yeah. And I think you might be onto something with what he was relating to through those lyrics. So that makes a whole lot of sense to me, but I, n I never would have put that together. So I, this is why I love having guests on this show, because I always <laughs> learn something. 
I don't know. Like it's lyrics like that where it doesn't necessarily like visually paint you a picture, but there's something about how the words sound and they fit together and then sitting and thinking about what it means mm -hmm. that it just paints this mental image that's not picture forward. Right. That just is such a testament to his writing ability and his songwriting ability that I think really is kind of what sets him apart as a songwriter. Even when his sound has changed, uh, even if, mm -hmm. if if the genre has, has shifted, it's still the same songwriter. It's still the same person writing the lyrics. And you can mm -hmm. see that when you look at a song like Submarine, and then you go back mm -hmm. and look at this song, and even when you go back mm -hmm. further into something, something corporate era, you see yeah. this poetry through his writing that you don't get that with all songwriters. You talk about misheard lyrics a lot, mm -hmm. and... My misheard lyric in the song is uh, definitely in the chorus. Apparently, I actually pulled my album to, to double check your lyrics because I know you said you print them out online and you're correct. It is, we're just like old ships running aground in search of water. I thought it was oceans running aground, not old ships. So <laughs> The lyrics I pulled said that. Did they really? And See, other people have heard it. Yes, <laughs> yes. So you're, you're validated. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I actually went to the liner notes because I questioned that. I was pretty sure it was old ships. That's what I've been hearing all this time. Mm -hmm. But somebody did put out there online, uh, you know, what I thought was a reputable website for lyrics, and it says oceans running aground. Mm -hmm. But the liner notes do say old ships running aground. There's must be a lot of people who think the same thing, whether they read it online somewhere or just heard it. So. Excellent. That that took me down a deep dive of Wikipedia to figure out. I've he obviously heard the term ships run aground before, but I yeah. didn't really know what it meant. And did you look into that much? No, I didn't. I'd know? be curious to know, though. Apparently, ships running aground tends to be accidental or unintentional. And so there's a few different ways they classify it. One is simple, where it's stranding, they say. And that can just be like, is the hole is up out of the water and on land and it can't get back into the water, right? Mm -hmm. There may not be any damage with that. Then there's a little bit more damage, which is breach of the hull and flooding. And it says it may substantially compromise structural integrity, stability, and safety. And I think kind of having that idea, like we're just old ships running aground. So we feel like we're like substantially compromised in our, our integrity, our stability, and our safety because we're looking for water. Also just paints this really beautiful picture, you know? Yeah, and, and I think the whole analogy is, um, it's talking about people, you know, right? What we're trying to do, kind of like what I was saying earlier with the, you know, I feel like we're running from place to place, we're doing all these things, but really we're just humans that need water and trying to cope with our daily lives, mm -hmm. trying to get through the day sometimes, trying to overcome tragedy, trying to um, figure out who we are and move through mm -hmm. the world. That's a neat analogy with, with the ships, though. In my opinion, ships is a better line than ocean. So good job, Andrew, for... A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, when I read those lyrics, the ocean's running aground, I was like... Well, that's not the way I've been singing it all these years. So let me check into that. So finally, I was right on one. You did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what I was not right on is the bridge. Again, I'm going to go back to I've never mm -hmm. known these lyrics. I had no idea what he was sing singing here. And he says it. He sings it really fast, by the way. I'm not going to try to sing it. But I think we're learning that the answers never come in search of water. I think I'll stay in here to watch the people run in search of water. So he sings mm -hmm. it really fast, so I understand why I wouldn't have heard it. And I think I've always focused on, I think I've sang In Search of Water while he's singing that. But I love those lines, though. Again, we're, we're constantly searching for something more. We're trying to figure out who we are. But I don't know, does it end on kind of a down note then? Because I, what I also thought of with these last, these final, these com kind of coming to the end here, I think we're learning that the answers never come. I think I'll just stay in, basically stay in here to watch the people run. Is he saying, what's the point? I, I don't like to think no, that. I, but. So I feel like, you know, earlier he says, we're tired of waiting. All bandages and strings hold you together and keep you up enough and drift in no direction. So it seems right. Mm -hmm. That to me is your 20s. Right. Okay. Like you think you have to figure it out. You've got to be successful. Oh, my gosh. I'm like pushing 30. I need to have like my career. I've got to be here and there. And then like you hit your 30s and you realize like, oh my gosh, there's so much life left. Yeah. And I feel like that's what the bridge is. Like you realize 
you don't have the answers and you may never have the answers and like that's okay because like how often did we sit around i mean i don't have children i know you do but like when you were little you thought your mom and dad knew everything right like oh, yeah. they always had an answer and now you're the adult and like oh man how is that <laughs> right? well sometimes sometimes you pretend to know everything but right. <laughs> so now i get where my parents are coming from so like you you get to this point where you realize like you know what i don't have the answers and like that's cool and like my my job is just like take it as it comes and figure it out mm -hmm. and like that's kind of what he says and i love this i love this about what he does with choruses mm -hmm. where he changes just a little word yeah. And that's what he does. He says, you know, before he says, I'm in no hurry to figure it out. And in this last course, he said, and there's no need to worry. We'll figure it out. And like, to me, that's yeah. just so hopeful. It does. You it know? does like, end on an up note then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, I, I really love it. We did, we did skip over my favorite line of this entire song, though. Oh, we got to go back then. What is it? You take your girlfriend to a drug deal, fall in love, and now she wears a diamond ring. Yeah, those lines are the most memorable to me and yeah. what's interesting to me about that whole that that whole piece i'll just say yeah we are just these people such tragic little things mm -hmm. just that line feels very serious introspective and then the yeah. very next line you take your girlfriend to a drug deal fall in love and now she wears a diamond ring so yeah it goes from like this serious introspective line to but that's just life you know it is and like I don't know why this paints such a picture because it's like it's a one liner. It doesn't give you that much detail, but uh -huh. it just paints this picture to me of like yeah. he was hanging out with his friends at the park or, you know, at someone's house and mm -hmm. buying adult things. <laughs> and then like he just like falls in love with his girlfriend and they have this, you know, night together where they just like bond and now look at them and where they've come from. And I don't I just love it. Yeah, there's not a lot of description into like paint you this really flowery language, but it just, I think it must be just like the juxtaposition between being tragic and like having this work out for you and you, to this like something amazing. That's a great way to put it. It goes from sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes things do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you just never know. And, it, and sometimes it can be something as simple as that. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did pull his book too to see like when he talked about dating Kelly, if this was about her at all. And he talks about going to all these different things and like this party and and that event and this bonfire. He never mentions a drug deal, so this may or may not be a false. <laughs> it just <laughs> so, it just didn't make the book. Yeah, that, that he particular skimmed over night, it or, yeah. or he invented it. <laughs> That's yeah, maybe. <laughs> the album as a whole is very relationship focused. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. this song in particular doesn't have much mm -hmm. about his relationship with Kelly, but mm -mm. there is that one line. So, yeah. so we get a little bit. We get a little bit of the story in this song. I think the other interesting thing about this song too, listening, when songs end, usually, you know, the way that the chord that they end on, and, and I apologize, it's been years since I've taken music classes, so I'm not going to have, you know, the correct terminology for everything. But normally you end on a chord where it sounds final to your ear. Mm -hmm. So it kind of has, you know, a, a major chord has that, that, that deep sound to it, right? Yeah. This song doesn't end down. His voice does, but the chord on the piano, it actually ends up like there's something more coming, which I also think is, is really nice. The very end of the song, you mean? Mm -hmm. The mm. last chord isn't like one of those final chords you expect to hear, which I, I think is telling for the song. It's like there's more life, there's more coming, and so I, I think that was a really nice music. Oh, I didn't choice. notice that either. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, I see why you wanted to talk about this song. You have a lot to say about something that I wasn't sure what was here, but you brought a lot to it. So yeah. wow, it's you have uh, kind of deepened the meaning of the song for me, actually. Well. Good. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Just like you did for Out of It, actually, come to think of it. So, uh, in a different yeah. way, because this is a song I feel like I've had a relationship with throughout the years, you know, with, with the way I enjoyed it. But now mm -hmm. I can enjoy it even more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I will say the one downside of this song, like when you listen to it, does it like elicit any sort of color association to you at all? I don't think so. No. Like okay. I said, I, I really just kind of see. A city and and things happening and a kid going to a drug deal with his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. 
And then, yeah, not not really much else with the visuals. So more like gray buildings and everything. Yeah. Yeah, same. And so I'm a little sad. You know, normally his songs, he'll talk about colors or he'll talk about different things in mm-hmm. it. And like no color in the song. He doesn't yeah. mention any of that. But yeah, he does mention true. water. Which, uh, yeah, we, we get a lot from Andrew, and which is good. I it's I look for those little nuggets. It's like, ooh, it's another one of those, you know, sort of thing. So I, yeah. li- I like those 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 callbacks in the lyrics. I do too. And I, and I think it's telling too, that like, we're talking about people, we're talking about their lives. We're talking about how things are entangled and, you know, like as humans, well, it, to get pedantic, it depends on your age, but about 70% of you is made up of water. So that idea that you're looking for something, that thing that you're looking for, you're in search of water, mm-hmm. you know, I think is, is, um, a really nice way to explain like, even if water isn't water, like you're hungry for that next career move, you're hungry mm-hmm. for setting that family up or, you know, whatever it is, like you're, you're always searching for something or yearning yeah. for something. And so using that analogy, I think is pretty fitting because of the fact that like, it makes sense from a, like a meeting your needs aspect of like, yes, everyone needs water versus like what your higher level of needs are, you know, yeah. like the, that acceptance, that family, that bond. Right. And I think there's I think there's a bit of an inclusive message here, too, that we all have different needs. We all have different wants, uh, you know, to an extent. But we all need water. We're all human. Mm-hmm. We're all we're yeah. all in this together. We're all do we're all actually doing the same things, mm-hmm. just in a different way. I'm sure you'll touch on this when when you get to tilt at the wind. But like he even kind of references that where he he says like I have everything I need, but I still have this hunger. And like mm-hmm. I'm sure as you as a, a dad and a professional, like I can completely relate to that where I'm at. I you know yeah. I'm still fairly early in my career, and like sure I've got you know my family and my husband and i have this great career but there's always this yearning this drive this passion that i want more or i want to make a name for myself or do great things and like this song too i feel like really touches on that where it's like you're just you're looking for that next thing Mm -hmm. yeah and so i i think the nice thing though that they talk that he talks about in this though is just like how entangled you are and so like you can't lose you know, the forest for the trees, you've got to stay connected to the people around you because that's important too. Yeah. Well, well put. Sorry. I don't, I don't think I could have said it any better. So I'm going I'm to leave that right there. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it feels kind of trite to even talk about the music video at this point, unless you do you have a lot to say. I, I just feel like I don't have anything to say about it. The whole short film release on, I haven't watched any of them and just like been in love with them. All right. You know, I'll, like, I'll say it. I don't get it. I'm like, okay, is this like, I'm trying to figure out, is this like a homeless gnome that's on a park bench? I don't know. Um, Everybody listening should just go watch it, I guess. Spend three minutes of your life and you'll probably watch it once. I mean, kudos to the artist. I mean, great job. You know, it's, it's, it's claymation. It's, uh, it takes a lot of work. I know I've, I I used to dabble in claymation many, many years ago and it, it takes forever to make something like that. So it's pretty impressive that you can create a story out of that, but Mm -hmm. In term, in relation to the music, I just don't get it. I don't either. The only the only way that I can even tie this back to the song is like he was up on the top of a hill, and then a kite came up from below. So obviously, there's people down there, and he's isolated, right? And the mm-hmm. whole pu- purpose of the song is like to get out of isolation. So he built himself a way to fly somewhere, hopefully to people where he's yeah. not isolated anymore. Yeah. But like that's the best I have. <laughs> That's that's a lot further than I got because I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't help but believe that one has nothing to do with the other and it's just music set to a, to, to a video. But I hate to say yeah. that because I'm sure there was some intention somewhere behind it. But I watched these videos that were released for the people and things uh, for the, sh- you know, the short films. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize these exist. So if you don't just go on YouTube and type people and things uh, short film and you'll get them all. Every song has a short film. Uh, associated with it and it's uh you call it a music video you can call it a short film but it's it's each song is set to a different uh a different video and uh some of them are animated and some are claymation and some are actual you know people doing things so yeah it it's not my favorite thing i wish i understood more behind it and as someone who's not visually into like drawing and painting and the arts like maybe i'm missing the point uh there, there's a very big possibility that's true i so. <laughs> i completely think that's possible in my case anyway 
because I, yeah, I don't always get visual art. So, yeah, I don't know. I just, I wish that I understood more and like, maybe, maybe the person listened to the song and that was the feelings that they elicited. And then that, if that's, that's it, that great. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I agree. I feel like the song is divorced from the video pretty well. It's a great way to put it. That's, that's how I feel. Yeah. Or I don't get art. One of the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So would you say that uh, People Running is your favorite song on the album or not necessarily, or do you not rate songs that way? I would say, yes, it's my favorite out of the ones that were designed to be on the album. It's obviously going to be number two to out of mm-hmm. it, which I like realized in retrospect that now we have talked about People and Things twice, which is not my favorite album overall. So. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we yeah. ought to talk about everything in transit next time. Just... We must, we're going to have to, I think. <laughs> yeah. But it's... I don't think of out of out of it, and I know it was, but I don't think of out mm-hmm. of it as part of people and things. But in a sense, it was. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really think of it that way when you proposed the song. Yeah, yeah, and and I think it is for me because it was on that album, right? Mm-hmm. So like because of the album that I had, that it just fits naturally into the to the catalog for me. But yeah, if you if you don't have it, then yes, this is my favorite song on this album, as was set. That's that's high praise. There's a lot of great songs on this album, so. Mm-hmm. I think this is a a really nice display of a lot of things. Like you can feel influence from a ton of different bands in this. Mm-hmm. Obviously from Matt Tyson. I think having Jang's Addiction in there playing on it, like there's obviously going to be some influence from that and then yeah. that's I think why you can hear a little bit of difference in the sound of how the instruments kind of come in and come out. Yeah. Yeah, overall, I just I love it. I think I think it's a, it really showcases so much things. His songwriting, his voice, the instrumentation of the band members, like all pieces of it. I mean, like, again, let's let's throw people and things on the list and let's let J-Mac open it up a little bit on the, on the drums. I'd be good with that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a fun, it's a fun full band song. It's one I want to sing along to. It's one I always appreciate when it comes up in my playlist and when I'm listening to the full album, of course. Mm-hmm. And it's just, like I said, it's kind of one of those high moments for me on this album mm-hmm. as a whole. And when it comes up, even though, you know, maybe it's not my favorite song on the album, there's a couple I'd put ahead of it, mm-hmm. but it's it, it's up there. It's, it's just a fun one I like to hear. It's one I, I kind of mm-hmm. look forward to. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast again. It's, it's always a blast, and I appreciate you coming on. And uh, I feel like you brought, wow, a lot of things for me to think about the next time I listed this song. Good. And Good. hopefully everybody listening feels the same way. I'm sure they do. I absolutely love being able to sit and nerd out over song lyrics with someone. So thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime. Anybody listening, feel free to DM me on Instagram and or email something in the wilderness at gmail.com and uh, chat me up because, uh, like I just said to Lindsay, I... I love talking about Andrew music and talking about song lyrics and nerding out too. So just like Lindsay does. So thanks again, Lindsay. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. We are just these people running around and there's no need to worry. We'll figure it out.